what gives you pleasure when you read this? What sticks out to you? What excites you? What confuses you? And sort of going about it that way, instead of asking, what does it mean? Because what does it mean scares me? Even if you asked me about my own poems and said, okay, so what does this mean? I'd be like, oh, I can tell you what I was thinking about when I wrote it. And I can tell you sort of what some of the thematic concerns are or um, what the metaphor means. But, you know, trying to sort of like give a Cliff's Notes one sentence summary to describe something as complex as a poem sort of takes the joy out of it. So I, I get, I get the, I get the sort of like anxiety around poetry. And I think it's mostly because even teachers sometimes are nervous about poetry and therefore pass that anxiety on to young people. <laughs> Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, thanks so much for tuning in. That voice you heard in the intro is Maggie Smith. Maggie is one of my favorite poets. Now when I say one of my favorite poets, I don't exactly read a lot of poetry because I'm very intimidated by it. But I have found Maggie to be very accessible and relatable. And even though I am no expert in reading and understanding poetry, I have found it to be quite a mindful activity for me. I'm the kind of person who tries to fly through books. Usually my audible is set at 2x, trying to digest as much as I can, as fast as I can. So poetry has been a good way for me to press pause because it's intended to be read slowly and intentionally. In fact, I've been carrying around Maggie's Goldenrod book in my bag for months And as I've been moving away from social media, I've tried to swap it up where if I feel like I need to read something to fill my brain instead of jumping on Facebook, I'll take a few minutes to read one of her poems. I certainly don't understand them all, and she'll explain today why that's not even really important. In spite of that, I have found that it's something that helps me focus, something that pulls me off autopilot, helps me to pause and think more deeply. Maggie's going to read a few poems to us today, and she's also going to tell us a little bit about being a creative kid and what that was like. And for those of us out there raising creative kids, ways that we can encourage that. I hope you enjoy my chat with Maggie. Hi, Maggie. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. I am a fellow Ohio girl. Oh, yeah, I was oh, born. You're my people, right? I was born and raised <laughs> in Northeast Ohio and my husband and I are Miami mergers. So we met at Miami. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm in central Ohio and, and have been my whole life. So I, I suppose that makes me a Buckeye though. I'm not much <laughs> of a default. sports fan <laughs> by <Right>. default. Yes. <laughs> every, every baby born in this town is a Buckeye. Yes. Yes. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I, I think I'm, I'm maybe primarily known as a poet, although um, it, it seems like I'm writing more and more prose these days. Um, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio, where I still live. Uh, I work as a poet and editor and teacher and sort of varying <laughs> ratios depending on the time of year. I have two kids. I'm a single parent to two kids. Uh, Violet is a uh, 13, almost 14, eighth grade this year. And Rhett is uh, almost 10 um, here in October. And he uh, is in fourth grade. And so uh, we just, they, they, they just got done having a very free range summer, which was a lot like my childhood, where you just get to go out and play yeah. with your friends all day and come home for meals. Right. And were you able to work at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. I, I started the summer very skeptical thinking I would need to get up at six, you know, five or six in the morning and work before 
they got up so that I would be available to them during the day because that's important to me. Um, and so I did that for a while. And then I realized that my son was out playing all day with neighbor kids um, and didn't really need me most of the time. Um, and my daughter was sort of off with her friends or collaging in her room and didn't really need me most of the time. So I started sleeping in and just working in the middle of the day, which was brilliant. Wow. I love that. And what are you working on right now? Um, I am in edits, um, copy edits on my memoir, which comes out in April. So we're in the sort of production phase of that. And I'm working on looking at student poems because I have grad students at two different universities this year. So I'm, I'm, you know, reading their work and commenting and always writing poems. I mean, I'm always, whenever one knocks, I'm happy to open the door. It just doesn't happen every day. Yeah. So I am very new to poetry. And if I can be perfectly honest, um, reading poetry has always made me feel pretty incompetent over my life because I don't understand a lot of it. Do you hear that a lot? I hear it a lot. It makes me uh, always makes me a little sad because I just think like, oh, whenever someone says, I feel like I don't get poetry, I think, oh, I'd love to know what your first or second or third exposure to poetry was because my gut instinct is you probably had a teacher who tried to get you to tell you to tell her what something meant. Yeah. And I always, I think that's just the wrong way to go about it. So even with undergrad students, my whole thing is, what do you notice? Like, what do you notice in this poem? What choices did the poet make when building this little machine made of words? Like what, what gives you pleasure when you read this? What sticks out to you? What excites you? What confuses you? And sort of going about it that way, instead of asking, what does it mean? Because what does it mean scares me? Even if yeah. you asked me about my own poems and said, okay, so what does this mean? I'd be like, oh, <laughs> I can tell you what I was thinking about when I wrote it. And I can tell you sort of what some of the thematic concerns are or um, what the metaphor means. But, you know, trying to sort of like give a Cliff's Notes one sentence summary to describe something as complex as a poem sort of takes the joy out of it. So mm -hmm. I, I get, I get the, I get the sort of like anxiety around poetry. And I think it's mostly because even teachers sometimes are nervous about poetry and therefore pass that anxiety on to young people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I love that the idea that you don't have to understand precisely all of the components or what the intent of the poet was, you can still enjoy it, even if you don't fully kind of quote unquote, get it. Oh, totally. I, I, I love so many poems that if you asked me what it meant, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but I love what the person's doing with language or mm -hmm. what it makes me think about in my own life. So it just, if it sets me off in a direction in my own mind, it's successful, even if what the poet intended and what I gleaned from it aren't exactly the same thing. Mm, yeah. You know, I think that the one reason that I really love your poetry is because we are of a similar age. We're both moms, kind of similar life stages, and it feels more relatable to me. Do you think that's an important component in finding the right writer to read? Yeah. To and again, you know, if I mean, my daughter, the poetry she has read in school so far is, you know, Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman and Shakespeare none of which sound like her when she talks or yeah. have experiences necessarily <laughs> that reflect her experiences. And so if she didn't have it, any access or exposure to other poems, she might be like, well, poetry is kind of stuffy and formal, or I don't mm -hmm. understand it. And so I, I think it's really important to find work that speaks to you. Um, you know, we need to be able to see ourselves and also see beyond ourselves in, in work. And so, you know, teaching living poets and teaching uh, diverse poets, um, I, I think is, is really important. And just finding, yeah, finding your people that when you read it, you're like, oh, okay, I didn't think I was a poetry person, but this I get. That's, that's a, always a sweet place. That's how I have felt reading your work. Oh. And that's one of the reasons why I felt like this is an important episode, because I think that as most of the women listening are mothers. A lot of them have young kids. And 
I have felt such a different experience reading your books of poems as opposed to reading like a nonfiction parenting book. And I have switched what I keep in my purse to a poetry book rather than a parenting book because <gasps> oh, I can I love that. pop it open, read for 20 seconds, think about it and close it. And it's very low pressure. And it's kind of, it feels like a mindfulness activity. Uh, I love that. I love that. It's, it's almost like an amuse bouche, you know, like a perfect bite. So if you have a yeah. book of poetry in your purse mm-hmm. or on your nightstand, you don't have to, especially for moms, busy parents, it's, it's hard sometimes to get engrossed in a long novel or a nonfiction book because we're so busy and our attention is often diverted to various things and people asking for someone to slice an apple or can I watch the show or can you take me to Sam's or whatever the thing is. And poetry, it just meets you where you are because you can open it, read one poem, shut it. And when the next time you pick up the book, you don't have to remember what's happened in the plot, who the characters are, where you were at. It, you get to sort of be new with it every single time. Yeah. And it's, it's almost hard to be thinking about something else, like doing your to-do list while you're reading a poem, because you really have to be in it and thinking about all the pieces of it. And when I'm reading something else, it tends to be that my mind wanders a lot and it's, it's a different reading experience. I love, I love that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the language being sort of consciously strange or strange making um, and even mm-hmm. the form on the page, it's sort of like jolts your brain. At, you know, you know, you're not reading a manual. I think it does. It kind of, it jolts your brain into a new way, a new way of thinking. And I love this idea of it being um, a, a sort of mindfulness break to take a little time with some yeah. poems. It does. And it kind of makes me wonder with so much of the world, especially here in the US, we're just, we're on autopilot so much. I wonder if mediums like this that require a lot of pausing and lingering if I don't know I worry that they may die what do you think well and the the sort of deep irony of that is that one of the places where poetry is most popular (laughs) is social media so it's like on one hand we our brains are being slightly cooked to mush by getting access to everything all the time via computers we carry around in our pockets and purses Um, you know, it used to be that if you left your house, no one could reach you. (laughs) No one could email you if you were taking a walk in your neighborhood, no one could call you. Um, now we, we really are able to access others and be accessed at any point in the day all the time. And so that's maybe the downside because both writing and reading poetry, I think require, um, prolonged attention. Um, And the ability Mm -hmm. to really think deeply and notice and sort of go to that space in your brain. But on the other hand, one of the ways I'm always finding new poets and new things to read is from that very device that pulls me out of my own mind sometimes. Um, And so actually, I think it sounds counterintuitive, but something like Twitter or, or even Instagram have been I think really beneficial to, to disseminating poetry, maybe even to people who didn't think they were poetry people. Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes you see like one little square meme that is a poem pretending to be an Instagram image and you, and you read it and you connect with it and you don't even realize that you're reading post poetry. You think you're just scrolling on Instagram. Yes. That's how they get you. So it's, it's the sort of like, I love this as like, as gateway, right? And then maybe you go down a rabbit yeah, hole. Maybe totally. you read that person and then you find their book. And then maybe you look, um, you look for other books that are adjacent or you see where they've published in journals and you find those journals and and maybe that leads you um, down a, a rabbit hole of more poetry that you just from just one little square on Instagram. We're gonna pause to hear from two sponsors. The first is a brand new sponsor on the podcast, Cozy Earth. After traveling for a month and being in an Airbnb, the best surprise ever was that I came home to a brand new set of sheets from Cozy Earth, which was much overdue. And let me tell you, they are pretty amazing. Cozy Earth has developed and crafted high quality goods with sustainably sourced materials from the earth, so you can get restorative sleep and recharge from the comfort of your home. 
Cozy Earth sheets are softer than cotton and they're made from a soft and sustainable viscose from bamboo fabrics. They're temperature regulating, which means they'll keep you cool and comfortable all night long. It's no surprise that they've been on Oprah's favorite list for four years in a row. And they come with a 10 year warranty. Cozy Earth has provided an exclusive offer for Simple Families listeners. You can get 35% off site-wide at CozyEarth.com with the code SIMPLE. That's CozyEarth.com and use the code SIMPLE for 35% off. Try them out. They definitely have my partner's seal of approval, that's for sure. The second and final sponsor for today is Indeed. Think about someone who has changed your life for the better. How incredible would it be if your company could find more of those life-changing people right when you need them? If you're hiring, you need Indeed. It's the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You don't have to spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. It's simple, which is what I love the most. Indeed does the hard work for you. Sponsor a job and boom, Instant Match shows you candidates whose resumes fit your Indeed job descriptions immediately after you post. So with Instant Match, you can start hiring fast. Indeed knows that when you're doing everything for your company, you can't afford to overspend on hiring. So visit indeed.com slash families to start hiring now. Go to indeed.com slash families. Indeed.com slash families. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing is not available for everyone. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Maggie. I like it because it's such a contrast. I feel like so much of the internet is moving to this short form, little bits of information, especially in the parenting world. It's like, here's a one minute tip to do this. And you really want to take in as much as possible. There's this movement towards just tell me what to say. Give me a script. Tell me what to, how, how to talk to my kids. Yeah. And that's really exhausting to me because then I feel like I need to memorize it. (laughs) But, um, yeah, it's a different kind of a different experience with language that really, for me, forces me to pause and slow down and be mindful. And that's not something that's easy for me. Oh, I mean, I I think we're all in that space. I mean, there's a reason why like TLDR is a thing, right? Like, um, we all want the sort of like little fortune cookie, cooked down version of things that because we don't have time to read the whole post the whole article the whole book you know just tell me what I need so I can implement it especially parents you know when you're when your newborn isn't sleeping or can't latch or your kid is tantruming at school every day for no reason or whatever the thing is you don't really want to sit down and read a 300 page book (laughs) right you want someone to tell you how to fix it um so short form has its place (laughs) Yeah. You know, I think that when I, when I was in that stage, for sure, I wanted just someone to just tell me what to do, but I also kind of wonder this contrast of what if you paused and took a moment of mindfulness, reading something meaningful that you could reflect on, and that could bring you back into that moment and bring you some presence. Would that actually even be more beneficial than getting some direct one minute instructions on, you know, what you're supposed to do that might work one day and won't work another day. Oh, probably. I mean, that's the the one piece of advice someone gave me when my children were very young and we were trying to get them to sleep and eat and do all the things that yeah. now seem, you know, I wish they would do less of probably both. But <laughs> um, uh, I just remember someone saying, well, they're not robots, so you can't fix it today and sort of program them for the future. Like yeah. what works today may not work tomorrow or may not work the next day. So I sort of like this idea of taking time and, and also, um, sort of practicing mindfulness ourselves, because sometimes the answer is, and it's not an attractive answer, but the answer is that thing is going to fix itself over time. And there is no quick answer. And the best thing you can do is be as at peace and solid and calm and grounded yourself (laughs) so that whatever, whatever, you know, parenting life or work life or whatever throws at you you know, you can, you're in a good place to cope with it and not be you yeah. know, kind of scrambling. Poetry does I that. I totally agree. Yeah. For me too, for me too, in my limited experience so far. Um, but I, I have absolutely felt that. And, you know, I wonder, do you have, it, it sounds like you've kind of had mixed experiences with the impact of social media on your work. Do you have boundaries around social media? Does it interrupt your flow when you're writing? How do you manage that? 
Um, well, when I'm writing, I'm not usually, I don't really have my phone sort of handy. So that helps. And I also, um, I think one of the things that is useful to me, and this is not intentional for this reason, but I write longhand before um, anything goes into my computer. So I'm actually not sitting at a computer where I could get email or, you know, a DM or whatever the case may be when I'm writing a poem. When I'm writing a poem, I'm usually either out on a walk and I get an idea, if I have my phone with me, I'll start mm -hmm. typing it into the notes function of my phone. So it is sometimes handy to have that little computer with me. Um, or I'm writing in a notebook, um, pen on paper, like a complete Luddite. Um, and so that, that actually, that process being sort of old fashioned does help me keep things separate. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I try not to devote too much time to, to anything on my computer if I can avoid it. And that's not just social media, that's even just, just responding to emails. Um, I was telling a colleague at dinner last night who's directing a creative writing program. And, and I just said, I'm excited for you to, to stop doing this too, like when this rotation ends, because then you'll have more time for poems and what the world needs from you more than emails, which are beautifully crafted. Mm -hmm are poems. And so the more yeah. time I can spend on the things that I think are most important, the better I feel. Tell me about you as a kid. If your parents were here, how would they describe you as a kid? Uh, my nickname was Checky Listy. Um, I liked predictability. I wrote lists about everything. I hated surprises. Uh, I was a classic firstborn, like bossy, um, I don't know. It's, uh, and I was very anxious. Like I didn't like going places by myself, doing things alone. Um, I needed the buddy system as a kid. So that's, that's probably what they would say. And also I spent a lot of time in my room listening to music and reading books and eventually as a teenager writing poems. So it would get to the point where if I sort of talked back, my mom would say, go to your room. And I would say something like, where did you think I was going in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> because it's not really punishment to be sent to one's lair where they have their stereo and all of their books. And, you know, that's, that was not yeah. punishment for an introvert. <laughs> I love that. Um, so I have a six-year-old, she just started first grade and she is oh. quite verbally gifted. She um, has a very advanced grasp on metaphor. Um, last year, she wrote a poem about a butterfly being the tourist of the sky, which, um, I wow. thought was pretty, pretty great. And I, oh. she told me I, when she was three, she told me that she was going to be an author in New York city. And I, I could be her nanny that lived above her garage. Um, which sounds like quite a plan. That's generous. <laughs> right. I know. I'm like, <laughs> I, I hate to burst your bubble, but you're not going to have a garage in New York city. So so nice, garage. but I mean, she, yeah, no, she may be, who knows? She may be the next Maggie Smith. Right. Um, but I kind of wonder when you have a kid like this, who makes an, a, a proclamation about a creative future, you know, I think that scares a lot of parents, this idea that a kid oh. could pursue a path like this. Do you think, did it scare your parents? No. And, and I think it, it didn't occur to me until I had kids that, um, my parents sent me to a private school where I studied creative writing, gender studies and philosophy, which really should have put me in their basement. Right. I mean, living forever <laughs> and ever big fear, I mean, right? <laughs> right. I mean, you want your kids to launch. Yeah. And so it would have been, I think, reasonable if they had said like, well, maybe a business minor, or maybe education or right. something, but they really didn't. And it didn't occur to me until having kids like what a, what a gift that was that yeah. they just said, you know what, follow what you want to do and we'll support you and we'll figure it out. And I mean, I had no idea what I was going to do. And so now my, my oldest who um, is 13 thinks she might want to go to art school. Um, and I mean, that's what she wants to do pretty much all the time is, is visual art. And it doesn't scare me at all because it, you know, I, I realize that the career path for a creative person can look a mil like a million different things. Yeah. Um, and actually I would be a lot more worried 
if I heard a child say something like, well, I need to be able to pay for my bills and my insurance. So I guess I'll get a corporate job. Yeah. Like who, that's not what kids dreams should be. Kids shouldn't be dreaming about paying mortgages and having life insurance. I mean, kids should be thinking about what kind of work they want to be doing in the world. So I, 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 um, I always rejoice when a kid picks something that just sounds exciting because we know as adults that no one knows what they want to be when they grow up really. Yeah. It's just, it will change a hundred times. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be an interior decorator. It didn't happen. (laughs) Um, there's still time, yeah. you know, I do. I think there's a lot of sensibility that goes into these conversations with kids though, this idea and fear, a lot of fear. Um, I grew up in a small town and I first in my family to graduate from college and it was, you're going to be a teacher or a doctor or, or a lawyer, something that has a predetermined nine to five. Um, it was very, very prescribed in that way. Like you can be any of these options, but I think that I, I never <laughs> Here's let the my, menu, right? Exactly. <laughs> Check a box. Um, checky list you, right? <laughs> right. Oh, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And I just, I never, I don't think I would have ever let myself dream of anything outside of the box because of the, I didn't have a safety net, you know, like I would have ended up in my parents' basement, like working at the local grocery store as, as a cashier, um, in a small town. And that wasn't what I wanted. So for me, finding something that was more secure and more predictable was just always the way there was never, I never thought of another way, um, that, yeah. So I don't know. It's just like a different, I think having, not having grown up in a family with, um, a strong support for the arts, I think it probably would have been discouraged or feared. I think the discouragement comes out of fear. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I'm, you know, my, my dad worked for the phone company and my mom did the books at a car dealership. I mean, I, no one knows exactly where I came from. Um, (laughs) so it's, it's, uh, and, and my, my sisters were both sort of like math and science, um, people. So I, I think I was sort of the anomaly, but, um, it, it is sort of surprising in retrospect that they didn't say like, you need to, you need to know what you're doing. I just, and and it's actually more surprising to me in retrospect that I didn't feel more panicked about knowing what I was doing, just given, given how much as a kid, I really loved structure. I think I just know, I know my limitations also. um, And I know what makes me happy. And that's sort of what I prioritized. And, and honestly, I actually think of family as a safety net. I mean, my parents didn't have a lot, you know, we were sort of just like pretty solidly middle class, uh, but I, I, I know to this day, and even as, you know, raising my kids, I know to this day, they, my family is my safety net. If something were to happen, I am not going to starve. Yeah. If my kids are not going to starve. We will figure it out and we will figure it out because we're not alone. My parents, my sisters, my brothers-in-law, my aunts and uncles, Um, I feel in some ways, a lot of freedom to take risks in my life because I have this, like this sense of community Yeah, and that's really important. Yeah. And I've heard you talk about your family and your connection to your extended family and your parents before. And it sounds like that's a real light for you that that helps you, especially as a single parent. Oh, I, I lean on them more than more than anyone else in the family. I always feel like the squeaky wheel because I'm the unpartnered one. <laughs> so yeah. I dibs on babysitting um, because I need it more than my sisters who have who have spouses. Um, but it's incredibly important. I mean, my parents live 20 minutes from where I live and we have Sunday dinner there every Sunday. Um, all of us, like all the sisters and brothers-in-law and cousins and, and everyone. And it's... Um, it's, I don't know, to me, it's, it's for me, but it's also a gift I think I'm giving my kids, yeah. which is this growing up that I had, which is lots of family barbecues and big holiday meals, all of us all together. And, and part of the, the gift of sticking around mm-hmm. and staying here is that we get to, they get to have really close relationships with other relatives, not just their mom in their house. Yeah. I love that. And with so many people being mobile now with, um, the pandemic and working from home, I feel like people are taking this opportunity to move. And a lot of times it's 
separating from family. And that's always a big change. I think that structurally yeah. that changes your life in so many ways. So I picked a couple of poems that I enjoyed for kind of a variety of reasons um, from your book, Goldenrod. And I was hoping you could read them and share a little bit about them for me. Of course, of course. So the first one is page 30, Inventive Spelling. Oh, and this is a really hard one to read because I don't quite know how to pronounce <laughs> the invented spelling. And I didn't realize it, you know, I wrote the poem and then I didn't realize it until I went into the studio to record the audio book. And I thought, well, I don't know how to do this. I have never said this, these two <laughs> words aloud, right. but I will, I will do my best. Uh, inventive spelling. There was a lesson I was supposed to learn, but didn't years ago. So I'm being taught again and again in a language I hardly know. Whatever it is, I speak so little, I could not go to a market and buy apples, bread, cheese. I could not find a hotel with a bed for me, nor a taxi to take me there. I cannot be myself in this language whose sounds and letters confound me. Inventive spelling is what we call a young child's translations from ear to paper cobbled from consonants and vowels. When I came home last night, after two days away, my son's marker note waiting for me on the table looked like this. Everything in this good and fine. Hope you're having a gut em. Everything is going fine here. Hope you are having a great time. I'm learning to read his mind on paper and master more each day. But the lessons my life keeps trying to teach me, why still do I misunderstand? Why still must I keep my eyes down, chalk to the slate? Mm. I think I heard a German accent in that. <laughs> Maybe it is German. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I literally came home from, I think, you know, doing a reading at a university or something. And I've been out of the house for a couple of days and on the kitchen table when I got home was this sort of, um, you know, we've all seen those when you see a, a three or four year old try to write something and it's all kind of phonetic and run together and not divided into words. Yeah. And I couldn't really tell. And then he told me what it said. Everything is going fine here. Hope you are having a great time, which is even <laughs> sweeter because it's not a, it's not a note for me when I get back. It's like a note from the, the past, like yeah. everything was fine. Right. And it just made me think about that, the idea of like getting to know our kids and, and learning to communicate with them and how really all of it is translation, you know, like what's inside them, mm -hmm. all language is translation. Every time you speak, you're translating what's in your mind to the air. And so many times words fall yeah. short and then try to speak to somebody else and get those words to make sense to them. And, you know, so, so much of uh, human conflict is from miscommunication and misunderstanding and um, sort of misconnection. So thinking about thinking about that when when words are really supposed to be my medium and how sometimes even even they fall short for me. I just don't always have yeah. the words. So I what I heard the message that I heard in it was that you can make the same mistakes repeatedly. You can do stupid stuff over and over again, despite how many times you learn, even if you know better, you still keep doing the same stuff and you can't really understand it. And oh, I think that's that in for there me, too. that's a message that I need to, oh, is that in there? Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, I needed to hear that, right. That I'm not the only one. <laughs> yep. No, nope. especially when it comes to kids. Yeah. Just the, the things that like seem, sometimes it's the most obvious things that we just not don't we we don't refuse to learn them we're just I, I just kind of think well I'm just not ready yet you know I mean you can't I'm just not ready yet so I think I'm I will I will internalize that lesson when I am ready to internalize it and until then I will be eyes down chalk to the slate trying to teach it to myself Right. And if we could give our kids that same grace, even though we try to teach them something over and over that they may, might not be ready for that lesson. Oh, yet. Absolutely. We, I was talking to my, my son the other day about that he and Violet learned to ride their bikes at the same time and they're four years apart. So I had a very young bike rider and a, a kind of older bike rider. And it makes sense. One of them is very physical and the other one it isn't so physical. 
So it made sense to me. And I just thought, well, the, the issue was never that it's too late to learn something or that you learned it late or that um, it wasn't the right time. It's when you wanted to or needed to, it was there for you. And, and so, I don't know, I think that's so much of my parenting philosophy is basically like meet kids where they are, not trying to force them to be where you think they're supposed to be um, or where you would like them to be. And yeah. so if, if we let them be themselves and try not to mold them too, yeah. too much, you know, um, I don't know. I, I, I kind of like that. It's a more a la carte approach, which is to say the way I parent my son isn't exactly the way I parent my daughter because they're different people. They need different things. One of them, if they're in a bad mood mm -hmm. and you joke with them, it cheers them up. The other one, it makes them angry because they don't feel like you're taking them seriously. Yeah. So it's the same approach doesn't work necessarily mm -hmm. with everyone. And so you kind of have to be multiple people for them. <laughs> yeah. No, no small task. No, no, but it keeps things interesting. Yeah. So the next one is page 70 small shoes. Uh, uh, this poem was actually made into a little film, um, by, uh, an organization called motion poems out of, um, the twin cities so neat. and an artist made this gorgeous film. So if, if people probably, if you just Googled motion poems, yeah. small shoes, you would find it. And the, the voiceover is haunting, um, the woman who, who reads the poem, uh, this is small shoes. If there are fewer stars now than when I was a child, I can't say which are missing. Who was the last to see them? Is it not a crime unless we call it a crime? It is difficult to document a disappearance, a boat full of stars capsized, stars lying in the sand, face down, wearing small shoes. Add that to the report. Some of the stars washed up in small shoes. So I picked that one because I was baffled by that one. Oh, I, I was like, this is a tough poem. <laughs> right. I know. I like, I, I probably read it like 15 times and I'm like, what, why were the stars wearing shoes? Like, what are the shoes? And you know, so it's what, but I, I was looking for too literal of an explanation, right? Well, yes and no. Um, this poem, um, this is a sad one. This is a hard one. Um, this poem was inspired by a photo um, of, I believe he was three or four. His name is Alan Curdy, uh, a little boy who, you might remember the photo, um, drowned mm. and was lying. The photo is of him lying face down on the beach mm. and he's wearing a pair of shoes. Um, uh, a refugee a child a, like a and I remember seeing the photo and the shoes look like and my son was the same age at the time and the shoes look like a pair of shoes he owned that all little three or four year old boys own and his little brown mop of hair that you could see um, though you couldn't see his face looked like my son's hair um, and so the the poem was really born from thinking about um uh what does it mean to, to lose a child um, and to lose a child in that way? You know, people f fleeing for safety, what does it mean? And, and then the sort of metaphor of, um, you know, this, the idea that some of the stars we see aren't actually there anymore um, and that we don't really notice when they go out. Um, I don't notice the difference between today's sky and sky 10 years ago. It just looks like stars to me um, and sort of trying to draw a loose, you know, connection between that and the human experience that mm. there are so many of us. And yet we are all like worthy and particular and missed, like yeah. dearly missed. I love and that. so that's, that's really, it's, it's hard to kind of sum this one up because it's, it is a, maybe one of the strangest poems in the book, but it really did come out of spending time with that photograph and just having to sit horror of it as the parent of a child that age, but with levels of privilege that meant I didn't have that grief that those parents had. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of your poems, I feel like, um, touch on these subjects that are 
are hard to talk about, hard to access. The one that, uh, the other one that comes to mind, I can't recall the name is the one with the flag at half staff in front of the school. Oh, That's, half mast. Yeah. Yes. Or actually, no, I think it is called half staff. Is That's, it, is it, is it half staff about driving by my daughter's, um, it's about driving by my daughter. It's half staff, half staff, okay. um, yeah. driving by my daughter's school, um, right yeah. after the Sandy hook. Yeah. Oh, so the last one that I was hoping you could read is page 24 at the end of our marriage in the backyard. I think this one's my favorite. The backyard, it probably looks like this right now. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> it is time to mow again. At the end of our marriage in the backyard, we let the lawn go to wild violets and dandelions to crabgrass, to clover, bending under the weight of so many honeybees, our children can't run barefoot. We do nothing, letting ivy snarl around the downspouts and air conditioner, letting milkweed grow and float its white feathers. We do nothing and call it something as if this wilding were intentional. If there is honey, I tell myself, we are to thank. All summer, the children must wear shoes, we sit out back while they crouch in the clover, watching the bees, calling out when they see sunny crumbs of pollen on their legs. Maybe no one will be stung. Late in the season, we sit ankle deep in weeds and flowers, in weeds we call flowers. Hmm. I love that. I, um, I think this is it. So I'm a therapist and I use a lot of metaphor in my work and I, in therapy, metaphor opens people up and in poetry too, right? It opens people up to these new ideas, new ways of considering things that they might not consider through a direct suggestion. So like, I don't know how many people have oh, told sure. me you need to like prioritize your marriage, take care of your marriage, right? How many times you can hear that direct suggestion and roll your eyes and be like, okay, okay. But then when you hear it and you see it in this sort of visual of a wilding, I just thought that was so magical. Yeah. Doing nothing and calling it something. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's one of the things that poetry is really, at least for me, is really useful for is finding ways to sort of process things myself even. Um. Yeah, finding if it, 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 it's like there's no feeling like arriving at a metaphor that sort of encapsulates something in just a few words that I could talk about for two hours. Like that mm -hmm. to me, <laughs> that's like that sort of gold medal feeling when, when I get that, I'm like, oh, that, that's it. Like I wasn't sure how to, how to describe this feeling or this situation, but that's exactly it. Yeah. I think the tricky thing with metaphor is sometimes I'll come up with one and I think it's brilliant, but then I ask other people what they think. And they're like, yeah, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> and it seems very particular. Like if it works, it might work for me, but maybe it doesn't work for everybody. Do you find that? Right. Sometimes. Yeah. I mean, that's, I was just telling uh, my students yesterday um, to, to beware of, um, I call it the Franken poem, which is um, the, the poem that gets sort of revised and cobbled together from the ideas of too many different mm -hmm. voices. So, because there is gonna be somebody who says, I don't understand the metaphor. Like you can keep the rest of the poem, but this metaphor has to change. But there will be somebody else in the room who will be like, whatever you do, don't change that metaphor. I totally got it, it's perfect. Well, it's not that one of them is right and the other one is wrong. You know, and so, so much of, so much of writing is really listening to what other people you respect have to say, but still learning to sort of filter it through your own vision and voice. So people can give well-meaning advice sometimes and, and even say, oh, I would love it if this sounded more like this, or what about this for a metaphor? And maybe it's good, but it just doesn't sound like you um, mm -hmm. or how you would say it, or it doesn't really click for you the way that it needs to. Um, and I think that's what, why it's so individual. So personally, if I have a metaphor I think is really effective and someone else doesn't like it, my feeling is like, well, maybe they just don't get it. And yeah. it's still actually really valuable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, metaphor is really just the assimilation of new ideas 
into existing concepts that we already have. And if you don't already have those existing constructs, then it's not going to work for you. So I think the nature of it really is that it's not always going to work for everybody, but I think, um, no, we can, is it something that can be taught? Do you feel like metaphor can be taught how to use it more effectively? Yes. I mean, I, I think really every aspect of poetry can be taught how to use it more effectively. I mean, uh, you know, I can't, I can't teach people how to like notice things better. Like some things are just up to you, like put your phone away, pay attention, write things down. I, I think, but yes, I think most of what we consider the craft of writing, like an effective line break, how to use sound and rhythm more effectively, um, word choice, metaphor, imagery, how, uh, what's the difference between a good title, a great title and a bad title? Uh, what makes one ending of a poem a better choice than another ending? All of that can be taught. I think the art really comes in with like how what is your vision? What is your voice? And then how do you assimilate all that knowledge when Mm -hmm. you sit down to build a poem? Um, And none of us, even with the same materials would build a poem the same way. Like if, if you and I were both given the same list of words that we had to use and even the same specs, like it has to be 30 lines, the stanza should be couplets. You can't use any word over three syllables long and here's the title we would still write completely different yeah (laughs) poems you know it's it's just that's the magic yeah I um would have read something from keep moving but I keep buying copies and giving them away (laughs) I don't know if you hear that a lot but oh my gosh that's That's the best that's the best my go-to gift for anyone going through a hard time thank you I, I I know it's it surprises me how often I hear people say that, or, you know, I, I buy five at a time because people are always going through things. And I think, oh my gosh, you know, I really, it it is a literal self-help book because I wrote it to get myself through the worst year of my life thus far, hopefully the worst year period. I'm not looking to repeat or top it. Um, And it has been like a sort of secret gift that was tucked inside that experience to have it touch other people. Because by the time I was done writing it, it had done its work for me. And so it's like almost bonus to see um, other people getting something out of it. It's, it's been honestly remarkable to me. Yeah. Do you get just constant feedback about how much it's changed their lives? Everyone reading, I feel like you just get a bombardment of emails probably. Yeah, it's surprising. I mean, the year the book came out, I did. Mm-hmm. And and even, I mean, it came out in 2020, even last year, and even now it's, uh, you know, I will get tagged in something or someone will post about it, or I'll get a, a DM or, um, or someone will go to my website and find my email and send me an email. And like, we'll say like, this is the thing I'm going through. And this page or this story really helped. And it just, um, always it is like an incredibly surprising and humbling experience to to think that it's still kind of making its way into the world and finding people yeah i feel like i've gifted it especially to people who have experienced a loss of a loved one um in the times where i don't know what to say i give them your book because i feel like it says all the things that i would love to be able to say more eloquently and in you know and like we talked about with metaphor less direct but equally as impactful Well, goodness. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Maggie. Oh, this has been a lot of fun getting to talk about parenting and poetry in in one, in one chunk of time. It's like my, my two favorite (laughs) things. So this has been much fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much to Maggie for sharing her wisdom and expertise. I hope after this episode, you'll feel inspired to pick up a little more poetry. If you'd like the links to get in touch with Maggie or any of the things that we spoke about today, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 322. As always, thanks for tuning in. I'm glad you're here.